Hi, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Data, your guide to today's modern data culture brought to you by Pragmatic Works. I'm Adam Jorgensen. And I'm Devin Knight. And in today's episode, we're going to be covering some best practices for data visualizations. Uh, but before we get into that, we're going to talk about some news first, like we yes, always do. I yes. love the news. Yes, and actually, we'd love to hear from you guys. What is your favorite part of the show? Yeah. Do you like the news? Do you like the main topic? A little combination of the both? Should we try and intertwine them a little bit better? We'd love to hear from you on that. But let's go ahead and get into our news for today. Maybe so, they just like it when you and I randomly talk about things. Yes, I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we've talked about this in the past. We're big football fans, right? Right. I, right. Love, I love my poor Jaguars. We don't love good teams, but we love good football. Yes. Yes. We, we don't love good teams. You like the, the Dolphins. Dolphins. You're, you're kind of warming up to the Jags. You're trying I'm, to. I'm trying to. They, just, they can't give me anything. Yeah. Uh, so one of the cool news stories that came out recently uh, with the opening of the season was uh, Thursday Night Football, which is the NFL Network's right. day to do football. Uh, they now are broadcasting on Twitter live. Oh. Live on Twitter. I did hear about that. Yeah. Is it because I told you right before we got into this? Uh, no, I heard about it before, <laughs> but then we prepped for the session, and then I read Thursday Night Football on Twitter, and I, oh, yeah, I, remember that. I filed that away. So it was kind of cool. I, I actually uh, you watched it for about 20 minutes, but it was neat, and it actually it streamed really well. Okay. Like, no problems with it at all. It seemed like it was probably in pseudo high def. That's good. Uh, but yeah, and it was what I really liked about it was they would post the link or they would post the the live stream multiple right. times, so I could kind of watch for a little bit, then go through my Twitter stream a little bit more and see okay. what else I wanted to look at, and then it'll pop up again. And I'm like, oh, okay, let me watch it a little oh, bit. For also, a while. kind of keeping you engaged. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, they actually beat out a couple companies. They beat out Facebook, Twi Twitter did. Twitter beat out Facebook and Amazon. They were also bidding for the same capabilities to be able to broadcast the, the Thursday night game. So Twitter may have gone in with the, we desperately need new audience, so we'll do this for no money. <laughs> they might have. They may have. Uh, yeah, Twitter, Twitter. while it's uh, pretty popular in the data community, overall it's kind of stagnated a little bit. Yeah, I mean, their, their new member growth is really slowed down while Facebook's is continuing to, yeah. to grow, which is, you know, it's a different day, different topic. Right, absolutely. But, but now that they have football, maybe, maybe that'll change. I, mean, I thought it was really cool. I, but you I were already it. on Twitter. I was already on Twitter, yeah. It didn't, it didn't bring me in. But maybe some more. So you probably know people who watch football that maybe aren't on Twitter. That's true. And, know and especially with the, you know, the, a lot of the trends around like uh, cutting, cutting the cord from cable and yeah, things like that. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, this is, gives you another way to watch it, which was, which was cool for me because I'm one of those people that have cut cable. So. Good, good. What else do we have? So the next story we have is around open source. Oh. Yeah. So uh, around open source, and specifically this was something that came out from GitHub. This is a story from Business Insider that Microsoft is now the number one contributor to open source projects on GitHub. Wow. And they beat out uh, Facebook. Here's the top five list. Microsoft, Facebook, Docker, Angular, uh, and Google are the top five lists for, wow. for open source contributors. And Microsoft is now the number one on that list uh, with, it, with something like almost, nearly 15,000 contributions wow. uh, to open source projects. And what was interesting about that is this is very different from the Microsoft yeah. uh, like five, six, a decade ago. Right. Uh, it's it's definitely around. I mean, what, what you, my thinking at least is it has a lot to do with who's in charge now. Satya yes. Nadell is being CEO very open arms to open source. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on this? Now? Yeah, I mean, I think you're seeing that, right? I mean, he's come out and uh, we've got, you know, uh, things that are running in Azure. There's a huge uh, embracing of open source technologies yeah. in the cloud, in integration with even things like R and SQL Server right. and acquisitions of open source technologies to try to help uh, not so much control them, which used to be sort of the, the attitude, but to make them better and then re-release them and re-open source them. Microsoft's even open sourced uh, the .NET runtime, lots of things from C Sharp, yeah. and uh, PowerShell just got open source. Yeah. So there's lots of things that are happening. Uh, and I think you're seeing the, the attitude that the more people that can use these tools in more ways, the better off we're all going to be. Yeah, and even within like the you know, uh, Adam and I, are, uh, Microsoft MVPs, even within the yes. MVP community, open did you source. Just name drop that. Like, I did. That was yeah. that was pretty good. Uh, but within the MVP community, those open source projects are now uh, contributions that you should say, "Hey, I'm working on these things." Right. And Microsoft is interested in those, and it helps towards your contribution as an MVP. Yeah. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so the last story I have for you is kind of a fun one. 
Have you ever played the game Angry Birds? I have. Okay. Yes. Are, you, are you a fan? I'm a human and I'm an adult, so I've played that you game. Play, yeah, at some point you probably played it. We're, we're addicted to it for at least an hour. And uh, yes. Then Maybe you, a little bit longer than an hour. You might have been done yes. with it. You've probably been done with it for months, if not years now. But uh, they have come out with so many spin-offs of Angry Birds. Yes. For a good reason. Yeah. It's popular. People still keep playing them. Yeah. There's Angry Birds Star Wars. Oh, there's um, Angry Birds. Uh, there's multiple Angry Birds Star Wars, by the way. Angry Birds uh, Domino's Pizza. Really? No. Okay. <laughs> there is, uh, there's an Angry Birds racing game that my okay. kids have. Okay. My kids have little Amazon Fires, and they, right. they play those. And then there's also this newer game uh, called Bad Piggies. Bad Piggies. Which is a spinoff of Angry Birds. Okay. It's based off the pigs that you're trying to right. kill, right. I guess. Right, I remember that. Um, but what's interesting about this is you're not, there's no birds in this game. It's all about the pigs. No birds. And what you're doing is you're building a vehicle for the pigs. Okay so that they can capture little objects that are around on the, the map. Okay. okay. And what's interesting about it, why it's kind of an interesting topic from a technical perspective here, is it actually teaches kids and adults that play this game a lot about uh, how a lot about science and about oh, physics okay. and how because you're designing the vehicle, yeah. right? You're okay. designing the vehicle. You could put different types of engines on it. You put different types of wings on it so it can fly if you wanted oh. it to. And so it teaches kids a little bit of acceleration. Does it have a hoverboard? It does not. It does not. You so there's have no Angry Birds, Evil Pigs, Back to the Future. Back to the Future crossover. Not yet. No, no. Okay. But you could have. Uh, I mean, and they make it fun, right? So you have a propeller, or you can have like a fan, oh. uh, which is obviously not as strong. Hopefully you can have, not. You can have one of those things that you would use like a long time ago to put out fires in your. Um, oh, like a little blower thing, <laughs> like a, like an accordion blower. Yeah. You pump up so and you, down. You can use one of those. So that's for a very slow vehicle. Right. Okay. So there's all kinds of interesting things, but it's teaching kids about science and it's and it's making it fun. It's making it. That's so, so cool. I mean, there's so much. Uh, you know, you feel like there's a lot of focus now in the last couple of years on STEM education, right. you know, science, technology, engineering, math, et cetera. So, you know, the more that we can get kids involved in that early on, where they see that as a, another thing that's cool, right? Yeah. Another thing that it's, it's great to be good at and smart at and being able to build those kinds of things. Uh, I'm pretty sure your kids would probably crush us at that game. They already do. Yes. Yeah, they already do. They crush me pretty pretty bad. And they'll ask me for help, and I'm like, sure, I'll help. And I can't. <laughs> maybe it needs wings. <laughs> maybe did you try the fan? Yeah, maybe some more balloons. They're like, know. Dad, Dad, <laughs> no. Those are terrible ideas. But I think, you know, that's probably, I, at least I would think that might be a little bit better, more educational use of their time than yeah. maybe something like Madden or something else, yeah. you know, which is, you know, again, fun to play, but not really helping their education, right, per se, right? Yeah, so that's it for the news today. So we're going to shift over to our main topic, which is as we're going to talk about uh, data visualization best practices. Oh, such a big topic. Yes. And we have a two-hour episode today for this, right? We do. Yeah, obviously, right. we're going to kind of scratch the surface on some of these things. Right. Um, but we're going to give you an idea of some of the practices that can make your data visualizations more effective, uh, what are some do's and don'ts, right. and then I even have a special five-second rule for you at the end. Which does not involve food. Okay, that's good. This time, but we'll get we'll get back to that. So, okay, I want to so hear let's about get that. Started. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's get started. So, uh, you know, what what are some of the things? Well, let me kind of get to here at least some of the basics here of designing some visuals. So I have some tips. Okay. To start so, us off. So you're going to talk about I, before we do anything else, you're going to talk a little bit about how we get started, right? Yes. So, yes. Because I mean, we may have some folks who don't design reports. Right. We may have some folks who design reports, but. They kind of learn how to do it on their own. Right. So you're going to give us some tips on how to get started the right way. Yeah. So okay. my number one tip as far as getting started is to step away from the computer for a minute. Step back. Step, step back. Take a step back. Step away from the computer. Hands on your head? No. That's, no. We're what not, if, what we're not I being want, arrested. What, what if I want to put my hands on my head? I'm just stretching. You can do that if you want. Okay. All yeah. right. Uh, but step away from the computer. Go pick up a piece of paper or go to a whiteboard and actually design out what you want the report to look like first. Mm, yeah, that's a good okay? point. So the idea here being is oftentimes we get too bogged down with the technology right. and what it can and can't do, and we end up forcing ourselves into just jumping into it, and we start dragging things in and trying right. to make it do what we think we want it to do, when really we didn't lay out what the vision is of what we want the report to look like to begin with. We think more about, I'm going to use this feature right. as opposed to, this is how I want it to look and, yeah. and be used. Right. I really want a combo it, chart in here somewhere. Right, right, right. <laughs> I want a sunburst or a tornado. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that's a great tip. I I mean, I, you know, there's a lot of people who get uh, get really bogged down, like you said, in yeah. the design, but they don't take a step back and just even ask the user, right? Yeah, yeah, and that's even what better. What does that look like? Yeah, so go to the whiteboard, plan it out first, 
draw out what you want the report to look like, bring the user in then, right. and say, hey, is this really what we're looking for? Does this make I... sense? Yes. And then oftentimes, if you do that first, you'll figure out a way to make the, the tool do it. Right. right. Uh, and your development will be faster. Yeah, exactly. Right? You've already envisioned what you want. Right. And even if the, the tool might be, if whatever the tool is, if it's limited in features, there's probably some way to make it do what you wanted to outline, or right. what you outlined originally. Right. So that's, that's my first tip for you to get started, is go to the whiteboard. Right. That's so. good. That's good. So once we actually start designing the reports, you know, we are on the whiteboard, right? Whiteboards are big. Right. So we can put a lot on a whiteboard. <laughs> yeah. Reports are small. Yes. You know, they're size of a piece of paper. <laughs> so how do we avoid cramming too many things? Because we've all seen those reports, right? Yeah. Where it's just too many things, too much noise. How do we keep from doing that? Yeah, so I, I kind of live by the theory, not only with reporting, but everywhere that less is more. <laughs> okay? that's, that's deep, Devin. <laughs> less that's, is more. <laughs> that's very deep. <laughs> less is more when it comes to reports in many cases, meaning just because you have space to put things in. Doesn't mean you need something to put something there. Exactly. Got it. Exactly. So uh, again, whole idea of the whiteboard that we talked about earlier, lay it on the whiteboard. It's OK to have some space on that whiteboard where right. you don't have something. In fact, it might, in some cases, be better to do that, because then you can focus people's attention in on what actually on matters. On what you care about. Yeah. Right. So plan for that. Focus on what's important. What is, what is the report trying to get across? Right. And then make sure that it's focused on delivering that. OK. Gotcha, gotcha. So, uh, so that's good. So we've got, we've drawn it out. We've looked at the whiteboard. Yeah. We have not used the entire whiteboard. Right. We've used a kind of a set area. Uh, one thing that I used to do uh, was I would actually draw a rectangle on the whiteboard. Yeah, I agree. And yeah. kind of make that my my region. That way we could make notes around it and all that kind of stuff and help the users kind of understand. Um, so, the first thing that a user typically is going to say is something about, okay, I like that, but can we change the Color. Ah, the color. So, yeah. uh, you know, we've done work for NFL teams and companies who have very strong branding. Yeah. And they'll say, you know, hypothetically, I need everything to be teal, gold, and black if we were yes. working with the Jaguars, right? <laughs> but, but one report that's all, all the reports being those colors are probably not a great idea. Yeah, absolutely. So how do we how do we pick? Yeah, so obviously if you're working with an organization that has a set of team a set of colors that are their brand and they live and die by like a, like an NFL team or whatever it may be. Um, then you're probably going to choose colors around that. Right. Uh, but this is, in, in, in most companies, this is something that a lot of developers kind of overlook. Report developers mm -hmm. overlook this. They say, all right, well, here's the default color. They don't even think right. about the color. They just right. send it out as it is. We got the chart. It looks like the whiteboard. Right. And we then, only had a blue marker when we did the whiteboard. Yeah, yeah. So everything's, everything's <clears throat> blue. So I think colors are important for a couple reasons. One, yes, they should associate with your organization. Uh, two, they actually need to go together pretty well, and there there are some websites out there to help you with that. There's there's problem if you do a quick search. So there's a lot yeah. of web developers that use this. I know Color Blender is one. Yep. Color Lover is one another oh. one. Uh, but there's there's a lot of websites out there to help you with this. Where if you know, hey, I want to use this color, it'll give you a couple accent colors that go well with it. Yeah. Now the even maybe more important piece about colors is considering people that maybe have uh, colorblind, maybe they're yeah. colorblind. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and actually that's a more predominant thing with men. It um, is. Men are, uh, I think it's 8% of men have some form of colorblind that they suffer from. Right. Um, and so when you're using things like, let's say you're using things like KPIs or indicators and things like that, which predominantly have things like red, green, yellow, and yellow right. uh, a lot of men Stuff uh, can't really see those very well, especially red, red green is, a, is a, one mm -hmm. of the more popular um, colorblind uh, thing, uh, that, that people suffer from. So uh, considering that, considering the colors that you use, um, especially in, maybe you don't work with anybody that's colorblind, but maybe you print things on black and white pieces of paper. Right. right. So um, when Not you, everybody has a fancy color printer. Not everybody has a fancy color printer, or maybe it's just not something you use on a regular basis. So right. um, not only choosing colors, but when you're looking at the colors, having some kind of legend right. on what they are. And if it's a KPI, and all the colors are kind of different shades of gray because you right. put it on black and white, maybe use different shapes and a legend that goes with the shape so right. it's very clear. Something that says, you know, bad, good, great, something right. like that. Right. So we it know. should be obvious. Right. It shouldn't be something that people have to struggle to figure out. Three different shades of green is probably yes. not a good idea. 50 shades of green? No. no. <laughs> I don't know who you're building reports for, Devin, but no. <laughs> so, uh, so we talked a lot about kind of some pros, but what about things to avoid? If you had a top list of things to avoid, yeah. what would that be? Yeah, so I have, uh, no, in no particular order here, the, my first one is something called chart junk. Junk. 
Chart jump. Chart jump. This is a this is an actual term. Okay, I believe you. Uh, that was coined by Edward Tuff, I believe. Yes. Yes. And uh, basically, it is anything that you put on a chart that takes away from the data, that takes away from what the chart's trying to tell you. So okay. think of things like uh, news magazines, like Newsweek, USA Today. Right. They'll put a chart on the front page of USA Today. And it'll have like it'll be talking about uh, obesity in the United States. And it'll have right. a big like hamburger in front of someone on right. top of the chart. Right. Something like that. So that's a little that's chart junk. That is chart junk. That's chart junk food. That is chart junk food. Boom. Because first New of all, term coin today. This is a, this is a true example that that was literally a hamburger on top of the chart. I could not look at anything other than a hamburger. <laughs> I have no idea what was on the chart because the hamburger was so in my face. Did you uh, go to Five Guys after that? I might have. Was it subliminal? I might have gone multiple times that week. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's so chart junk. Chart Let's junk is one. Get rid of the junk. Get rid of the junk. Put the junk in the trunk, not on the charts. Oh. Do you like that? You. Came up with that on the fly. On the fly. Or what's been what's uh, <laughs> no comment? Number two. What's what's number two? <laughs> number two I have for you here is uh, pie charts. Oh so yeah. Pie charts. You'll hear a lot of people kind of uh, uh, have a have a big. Uh, they don't like them, right? Right. Yeah, there's right, something right. about pie charts, and there's a some people do. Some people like them. Um, we don't like those people. We don't like those people. Now, right. here's the problem with pie charts. Let's explain the problem. First of all, they don't really show a distribution of data really well. Correct. Uh, because you only have this 360 degree pie that you right. can place data on. So if you have you know, 13 different slices on there, right. and half of them are roughly are 7 just, to 8%, percent, right. then it's going to be really difficult to distinguish between that 7 and 8% when that could be, if you're looking at money, it could be millions of dollars. And so taking that same data that you put on a pie chart, putting it on something like a uh, clustered column chart or a right. bar chart of some kind, right. makes it much easier to be able to visualize that data. With, with some kind of label. With some kind of label. So somebody yes. who's colorblind or if we're printing it, that type of thing, so the chart's clear. Right, But yeah, Absolutely. Def definitely not a pie chart. Plus, have you seen the pie charts that also have labels? Yeah, they Those get a little bit. Little, that's yeah. chart junk. That is chart me. junk. It becomes chart junk. Okay, so uh, that's two. Now, hold on, one more thing about the pie charts. Oh. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, add, I'm gonna add one caveat to this. Okay, okay. Okay. So some people just flat out say no pie charts ever. I'm gonna throw one exception in there for you. Yeah, I mean you don't ever want to say never. Yeah, here's here's my one exception, is if you have. And you you know you're never going to have more than two to three categories of data on the pie. Right. So let's say something like marital status. You're married or you're single. Right. Right. Uh, so you have two possible slices of the data. Um, there's, then there's more. There's more statuses. Well, we're going to simplify okay. it for this. All right. <laughs> that's that's why you go with something like gender. Okay. I was stuck with. Plus it depends on what state. <laughs> that's true. That's true. So married or single. Right. <laughs> It's 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 a much clearer chart. You don't have ten or twelve different slices you're looking right. at. It's it's a lot easier to read. Right. Um, now it's still not my favorite way to visualize data, but I'm giving you an exception in there that might be an might be an okay way right. to do pie chart. Uh, all right. So last one I have for you is 3D charts. Oh. 3D charts. These are still a thing. They are. Why? Uh, they're not just in Office 97. Oh. They actually still exist. They still have them in Office 2016. Yes. I don't understand. Yes, they do. Who is using these? Uh, so 3D charts are bad for multiple reasons. One, oftentimes the way that the 3D is shifted on the whatever the tool is, let's say Excel, right. it uh, can oftentimes, again, distort the way the data is visualized. Right. So uh, one example I saw was someone had created a uh, column chart, and in the column chart it had uh, years and there was a different uh, layer for each year. Right. Okay. And what ended up happening over time, the, the 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 newer years would actually block the older years, so you couldn't even see the data for the older ones. Because it was all because 3D it was three D and it was blocked out and you couldn't see it. That's terrible. Um, another one you see oftentimes like three D donut charts. They're like kind of shifted. I mean, it's basically a pie chart with a right. hole in the middle. Right. But uh, they're shifted to a point where you really can't. It's already a difficult chart to begin with to see, right. and then it's shifted to a point where you really can't figure out what the data is showing you. Yeah, that's ridiculous. So in general. Avoid 3D charts. I'm not even going to give you an exception on that one. Just okay. don't use them. So, so we talked about pie charts. Talked about hamburgers. Yes. And now you have a five-second rule, but you said the five-second rule does not pertain to food. <laughs> That's right. So I'm super confused. <laughs> yes. But I need to hear what this five-second rule is. So this is yeah. We mentioned the five-second rule earlier. This is uh, one of my favorite ways to determine if your report or if your chart. Is actually effective at all. Okay. Okay. So you you, so you just drop it on the floor for five seconds. You drop it on the floor for five seconds. As long as you pick it up within five seconds, it's okay to. It's effective. It's effective. Yeah. We'll okay. Go. No. So here's the rule. 
Take a report that you've developed. Okay. Hand it off to someone else. So here's your report. Just okay. A piece of paper. Hand it off to someone else. Give them no more than five seconds to look at it. Okay. If they can't figure out what in the world the report is trying to tell them, there's something wrong with it. So if they can't look at the data and say, oh, this is trying to tell me about uh, churn for our customer base. Right. Um, if they can't figure that out within five seconds, the basics of what it's trying to tell them, there's a problem with the report. You probably need to go back to the drawing board or the whiteboard. I really like that. Yeah. I really, really like that. I have one question. Yes. What if that person is a homeless person that doesn't know anything about your business? Okay. So <laughs> can you give them more time? <laughs> you can give them a little bit more time. No, so you should. Maybe 10 seconds. You should obviously give this to someone that knows your data. Okay. Um, okay. Probably someone that's not so vested in the development of it, but they know the data. Okay. So someone that's not. A little like, removed. A little bit but still familiar. It. Yes. Okay, that all makes sense. And hand that off to them. If they can figure out what it's trying to say, you're you're in good shape. If not, go back to the drawing board, figure out then your next steps. Okay. All right. That's good. Yeah. So one of the things that uh, we focus a lot on this, we focus a lot on design patterns, not on only reports, but right. ETL processes and things like that. Um, I'd like to recommend for the folks uh, a quick course. So we have what we just recently released is a mobile reports class. Yeah, because a lot of this changes. I yeah. mean, the general principles are the same, right. but when we're designing reports for mobile, yeah, that's a very different world. And it's one of the highest, recommend, highest requested types of work that seems to, to come through our doors. Yeah, absolutely. And so in July of last year, Microsoft bought DataZen right. as a, a visualization tool. Right. Uh, and it's now been integrated into SQL Server 2016. Okay. And so as part of that, it's actually considered part of reporting services now. Right. And it's the mobile reports capability of reporting services. And so we've developed a new class on this to help not only with some of the design pattern stuff, but just how to use the tool, right? It's right. a new tool right. that you might not be familiar with. So I recommend that you guys check out our new mobile reports and dashboarding class. It was developed by Mitch Pearson, a great, great presenter. I yeah. think you guys will really enjoy yeah. it. He's really one of our best trainers. Yeah, absolutely. So I recommend you guys take a look at that. Now, Adam, I have a question for you. You asked me a bunch of questions. Is it about mobile reports? It is not. Is it about colors? It is about colors. Oh, I like colors. We've been talking about colors and how to design reports and things like that. And right. by, the, by the way, I want to hear what are some other you know design practices that they're interested yeah. in. So if you guys can comment below and let us know what are some things that your best practices you consider. But here's my question for you. Okay. There's been a color in the room that we haven't been talking about. Okay. And it's on your head. I don't know if you realize that there is something on your head right now, but you have. Yes, you yes. <laughs> I do realize that. So you have, you're, you're wearing a, a breast cancer awareness yes. headband. Tell us a little bit about this and what, what, what are you doing uh, with breast cancer awareness? In so, October? you know, my family and so many other families have been impacted by uh, not only breast cancer, but many other types of cancer. And so I'm involved with the American Cancer Society and I'm part of their campaign around their Making Strides event every year called Real Men Wear Pink. So they pick a few folks from the communities around the country, and uh, we volunteer to raise some money and raise awareness about breast cancer. And yeah. so especially through Breast Cancer Awareness Month, which is October, we commit to wearing something pink every day. Uh, that could be everything from a pin to uh, one of the other gentlemen has a full pink suit wow. that he wears to work. Is that David Garrard? Uh, it is not. Oh. It is not David Garrard, although David Garrard, uh, former Jags quarterback, is um, he is one of the real men wear pink here locally in Jacksonville. So. Um, but uh, I couldn't go full pink suit. I don't think I could do it. Uh, but I do have a lot of newly acquired uh, pink accessories and clothing and all that kind of stuff. So we'll be showing all that off over social media. And um, if you would uh, support us, Pragmatic Orchestra is going to have a team out doing the walk. And uh, I'm raising money as well. So uh, if you feel like participating, please, uh, please donate or just come out and walk with us if you're local here to Jacksonville. So how would somebody go to contribute if they, if they were interested in doing it? Uh, if you go to uh, our blog at PragmaticWorks.com, we'll have more information about our team and uh, our fundraising and mine as well. Absolutely. Great. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed, again, this week in data brought to you by Pragmatic Works. If you guys, again, want to give us any feedback, post in comments below. We'd love to hear from you and hope you enjoyed the episode. Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks, everybody.